What's going on guys, Wei from Revolution here with Jeremiah Chan, our online writer, uh, and we're here hey to guys. talk to you guys about Daytona's today. Yeah, well, always glad to have you, Wei. Um, I think, you know, you've brought heat today with <laughs> four spectacular watches from what I think is the biggest name in sports watches and sports chronographs in particular, and that's Rolex. Uh, thanks, Jeremiah. So, you know, I brought these watches in today because um, our editor in England, Ross, he was looking at this watch when we were having our Zoom, which is the uh, 116508. Um, it's the green dial, yellow gold Rolex Daytona. And he was like, dude, that's a great watch. Uh, and then he kind of knows what I have in my collection. He knows these three other watches. And he said, Wei, um, actually, you've got a pretty cool, like, four Daytona collection. Um, it's pretty complete in terms of representing each of the eras. Why don't you tell everyone about it? So that's why I brought these watches in today. You said you went through three distinct, you know, phases in your collecting journey. And you started with sports watches, complicated watches, and then finally you went back to the simplicity, simplicity of elegance with, with Cartier. But... I'm assuming this is early on in your in your watch collecting journey. Hey, Jeremiah, I don't think there's a guy on the planet that doesn't dream about owning a Daytona. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in the uh, 80s, and so like the car that you have on your wall, this is back when people had posters on their walls. This is like before the NFT era, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> it was always like a Porsche 930 Turbo or a Testarossa. You always had like um, Farrah Fawcett or like on, on your. On oh, your it was wall. a Countach for me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Or, or that, and then and then the watch you dreamed about, and it, had they made posters of it, I, and I would have put it on my wall, is of course the Daytona. So um, I've got Daytonas here from each era. I'm going to start maybe with the first one, uh, the first official Daytona, which is um, a 6241, which is basically the black plastic bezel version of the 6239. So that's this watch, and it's kind of the watch that kicks off the whole Daytona craze, right? Um, uh, Rolex had made two chronographs previous to this. It had made the 6234, which I always think of kind of like a nerdy scientific watch, yeah, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's like amagnetic or anti-magnetic, so it means it's got like a soft iron case uh, to prevent it from magnetism. Um, it's also got both a telemeter and a tachymeter, and it's kind of, yeah, it's very scientific looking, black dial, luminous hands. Um, a cool watch, but again, I wouldn't say like the coolest watch in the world, right? Then after that, Rolex goes into the 6238, which I've always thought of their attempt at doing a gentleman's chronograph, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really elegant watch. It's a smooth bezel watch, and what um, is kind of nice about those watches is they have monochrome dials. I think the most common of those dials is an all silver dial, uh, according to my buddy uh, Edmond from Le Mans Edmond, and you please read his article online because he's a brilliant dude. There's also a gray dial, which is subtly different and more rare, and then of course there's oh, the all black okay. dial, right? The thing about that watch, of course, is the tachymeter is on the dial. So the first kind of really sporty uh, chronograph that Rolex makes is the Daytona in 1963, which is incidentally, this was not called the Daytona, it was called the Cosmograph. Yes, right? that's right. So there's two things that I think make the Daytona kind of a sporty chronograph, right? The first is the fact that it's got contrast colored subdials. And the second fact is that the tachymeter, which was previously on the dial, gravitates to the bezel. Correct, right? yeah. Um, and so these early watches, well, actually, like the 6234 and like the 6338 are all being driven by the Valjoux 72. Venerable movement, tri-compacts, beating at 18,000 vibrations an hour. I think specifically it was the Valjoux 722. You're absolutely yeah. right, sir. And uh, so the 6239, which is the metal version of this, or sorry, metal bezel version of the watches is from 63 to 69. From what I understand, uh, the 6241s are from 66 to 69, so they came out a little bit later. But the thing that's super confusing is that, like, kind of Rolex is all over the place during this period, right? Because, yes. like, in the middle of all of this in 1965, they launched the 6240, which is a screw pusher. Yes, exactly. Yeah, when everything else was only pump pushes. Correct. Um, there's obviously a really pragmatic reason behind this course and let me show that to you so the thing about this watch is it's beautiful but it's manual wine but it's an oyster case which means it's got a screw down crown in order to wind it you have to unscrew it in the morning when you want to wind the watch and then you start winding and winding and winding and when you're finished winding it you got to screw it back in right and that is supposed to make it water resistant which is the whole purpose of that, that oyster case yes but it's not water resistant because it's got pump pushers on it. Right? And there's so many dudes that like put these watches on their wrists and then just jump into the swimming pool only to emerge from the pool and see that their watch was like, you know, had a little bit of like chlorinated like patina to it as, as well, uh, which sucked. So that's why Rolex created the 6240, and which as I said, was from 65 to 69. But it's still nuts, right? Because even while they've launched the first like uh, screw down pusher uh, chronograph, they're still making pump pusher chronographs because they come out with the 6262 and the 6264. 6, 6, 4, yeah. Exactly. And those watches are basically the same as this, but with an updated movement, right? right? It was a 727? 727, yeah. And, with, they, and they increased the uh, frequency 
yeah, to yeah. from 18,000 to 21,600 Correct. You know, vibrations but, per hour. So I guess this is what they call the Paul Newman Daytona. Uh, this is a, well, when it first came out, it was called an exotic dial, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a three color dial. Um, it was done in this colorway, which has got kind of a cream dial with black uh, subdials, and then a black track with like red printing on it, which is really beautiful to me. And then they've done a version where it's a black dial with like cream colored subdials as well. And these are so rare. I think Andrew Shear from Shear Time, he said once that for every you know, 20 standard dial Daytona, there's only one Paul Newman. You know, um, I, I like to think that's true. <laughs> uh, I think it is. Yes. Uh, okay, so it's, it's funny because piece. when I got this watch, it was back in 2011, and it's one of the watches that I wear the least often, right? Oh, why is that? Uh, for two reasons. One is that, and again, this is no knock on people who like to wear these or whatever, but it's kind of like I feel a little bit like a cliche wearing this watch, right? Really? Yeah, I feel like I'm like the guy that like like just got into vintage watches and I'm like rocking out my Paul Newman mm. because all my friends will now respect me because I have like dope ass. Like, oh, I remember that phase on Insta when Paul Newman's were just popping up every other day. Exactly, and like and, and like it's kind of like that, like the hedge fund guy that makes a ton of money and he wants to impress sure. his friends with a vintage watch, he's gonna buy a Paul Newman Daytona. Again, there's nothing wrong with that but I don't know the other reason too is this wears really like an old watch which mm -hmm. means extremely fragile right so like I remember I was at dinner once in London and one of the pushers actually popped off of this watch Ooh. and I basically had to stop everything I was under the table with like my uh, like the light of my phone on everyone was trying to dig around like trying to help me find this okay and that's a concern I have with these watches as well. Like, you're, they're really, they're beautiful to look at personally, and maybe it's just because, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very anxiety-laden kind of guy, but I just don't enjoy wearing these watches. Right. As well, right. Just simply because you're never, you know, you're always worried about what's going to happen. So the next watch is actually the first watch that I bought, um, the first Daytona that I bought, and it's a 6265, right? So from 1971 to 1987, yes. they made the 6265 and the 6263. 63, yes. And the 63 is the, the plastic bezel version of this watch. Also, uh, now uh, you have the uh, Valjoux 727, but the cool thing about the gold watches were they were the first ones that came with that movement chronometer certified. The gold watches are the only ones that say superlative chronometer officially certified, which is important to me because I think that's what Rolex is all about, right? I always thought it was strange because, you know, the Daytona script appears, you know, on the earlier watches, but then for the 6263 and 6265, it, it disappears. You know, such are the mysteries of Rolex. Right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so this was a watch that I bought in 2009. It was my first kind of vintage watch as well. Um, and yeah, I remember like I, I bought it from Osvaldo Patrizzi's auction. Oh, right? okay. So he was auctioning off um, this guy named David Bly, who was a big Rolex collector, his collection. And I remember um, I was really interested in it. I was just getting into vintage at the time. I, you know, really interested in old Daytonas, obviously. And yeah, I managed to put in a bid for the watch and I remember winning it. The auction was happening in Milan. I was in London. I was listening on the phone and I remember I was in the middle of this like seafood restaurant called Bentley's Oyster Bar. Um, and I remember when I won, I actually jumped out of my chair and screamed, yeah, you know, uh, and freaked out the majority. Right, and everyone's looking at you. Yeah, 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 I was in I there. could imagine. But nonetheless, but again, it's, it's a great watch. And these watches, of course, feature the screw pushers as well, right? Um, so there's been, I think there's three different versions of these pushers. The first Mark I of these screw pushers is got very slender knurling. Uh, Mark II has got slightly broader knurling, but um, a plain edge on the top. And then Mark III has like a line on the top as yes. well, right? And there's several different bezels as well. This watch is nice because, it, you know, it's a box and papers watch. It has a bezel that is the same era. So it's a Mark II bezel from what I understand um, and Mark II pushers. So everything is like really complete on it. It's such a beautiful watch, and I love wearing it, but again, it's an old watch. And did I'm you a, have a mishap with this one? I did. So I remember, and guys, you're going to say I'm a clown, and I agree, I am a clown, but of course, I wore this watch because it's a sports watch, and it's mm -hmm. water-resistant, to spin class, right? And then I got out of the spin class, and I noticed the entire interior of the watch had missed it off, and I was like... <sighs> Oh shit! What have I done, right? Um, so, and then I then I, I was like, you know, freaking out. I wasn't sure what I should do. Should I put it in the sunlight to dry it up? But what if it condenses and it water drips into my my like priceless dial? What did you do in the end? I uh, put it in a drawer and just ignored it. <laughs> like, and then a day later, it seemed like it'd gone back to normal. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it's anyway. It's the perils of vintage collecting. It is, yeah. man. It, it I mean, really I, I have I have a similar story. I was holidaying with with a friend, and at that time, I had a Explorer 1 1016 and I had just came out of an air-conditioned room and you know 
the, the crystal just fogged up as well. <laughs> and I freaked out I exactly know. like you. What did you yeah. do? I couldn't do anything. It's like we just carried on walking and I just hope to the watch got to But like be fine. the whole time, all you can think about is your watch. Exactly. <laughs> like your friends. I couldn't even you. talk to my friend yeah. and yeah, I couldn't like, focus. It's like, it's like he might as well just be speaking a different language, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, for, so for guys that love watches, <laughs> when stuff like that happens, it's a disaster. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, the funny thing is I just want to say one last thing about this oh, watch. Okay. So it's funny because like, like there's a lot of auctioneers or like secondary um, sites that always tout um, like how incredible it is when they have a 14 karat watch, right? Um, and they're like, and incidentally, the 14 karat gold is much more resistant to scratches. Yes, because it's less gold. Oh yeah, I think the 6265 <laughs> comes in both 14 and 18 karat Correct, gold, and 14 right? were the watches that were sent to the United States. Right. And dude, you don't have to be like a freaking jeweler to understand that 18 karat gold is superior to 14 karat gold. Yes. Like if you want to buy a bar of 18 karat gold versus a bar of 14 karat gold, the 18 karat gold is just much more expensive. Yes, there's much no cheap. choice to be made. <laughs> it's more pure <laughs> gold. So I love how they're like very creative in terms of telling people like, hey, you know, mm -hmm. 14 karat's rarer, it's better. <laughs> it's not better, dude. Right? Okay, so let's go from there to the first automatic um, Daytona. Yeah, it's okay, so, powered in Daytona. So I want to quote Ross Povey here because um, he has said that everyone talks about Gerald Genta being the greatest the design genius ma of, of the 20th century, right? And I agree, Gerald Genta is an absolute genius. I think the watches that he created in rapid succession throughout the 70s, whether it be the original Royal Oak or the Nautilus or what have you, are incredible timepieces, right? But I would say that a person, and an unknown and unnamed person who's just as much of a design genius is the random, faceless, nameless dude at Rolex which designed this, the first automatic Daytona, the 16500, or in the steel version, 16520, right? Why? It's the perfect sports chronograph, right? It is the watch that like basically anyone that tries to make an automatic sports chronograph today in some ways cannot help but be slightly inspired by yeah, this, right? Yeah, I, I think this is the, the definer, you know, for all other sports chronographs that came after. Totally agree, you know? And honestly, this was the watch that, you know, changed Rolex's fortunes, right? So both of these watches were, I would say that was not terribly successful. I would say this is probably not terribly successful either, you know? I would like to say it's moderately more successful, but I think the reality is that they both were not terribly successful. And part of that also, I think, is the impracticality of having to unscrew your crown and then manually wind your watch every yeah. morning, right? But when they launched this, it changed Rolex's fortunes entirely with the, uh, for the Daytona. I mean, this was a runaway hit from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. But talk, let's tell me, Jeremiah, a little bit about the movement in my watch. Well, you know, Rolex moved from the manual wind Daytonas to an automatic movement and decided to go to Zenith, you know, to, to purchase a movement. And at the time, uh, Zenith was not doing so well. Uh, actually, even in, in 1969, the, the El Primero movement was created uh, by Zenith. But and I, that was the first integrated automatic Swiss uh, chronograph movement, correct? Correct. But I think in 1971, the Zenith Radio Corporation, no relation to Zenith Watch Company, had actually purchased Zenith. And they wanted to transition Zenith to make electronic components for, for quartz watches. And, and Zenith was like nowhere to be, to be seen or heard in the industry. And I think it was Ebel, or Ebel? Mm -hmm. uh, Ebel in the, in the late 70s mm -hmm. um, that purchased you know, all the new old stock movements and kind of restarted the manufacturing capabilities of Zenith. And that's why my Rolex came knocking in 1986. Zenith was able to, to fulfill those orders for Rolex, yeah. That's amazing. So um, exactly as Jeremiah is saying, so Rolex didn't have its own automatic chronograph movement, so they went to the Zenith El Primero, right? Which yeah. is the icon, one of the greatest movements, but with one very significant difference. So the Zenith El Primero was running at five hertz or 36,000 vibrations per hour. And they were like, eh, let's do 28,800 instead. So instead of five hertz, they went to four hertz for two reasons. One is that they were able to, um, well, first of all, you know, everything at Rolex has to be super, super, super reliable. So I, I imagine there was a concern related to that, but also they were able to extend the power reserve from 42 hours to 52 hours as yes. well, which was you know quite significant as well, right? Um, that having been said, there was a very significant amount of changes from a standard El Primero movement to a Rolex caliber 4030. Yeah, I think some that you can see would definitely be, you know, it's a new escapement, it's a larger free sprung balance wheel, yeah. even the reversal wheels for the automatic mechanism, it's, you know, it's the iconic uh, red wheels of, that you see on, on other Rolex yes. oysters, yeah. So one of the things I'm super impressed with from a design perspective, because I really do think this watch is perfect in terms of design, is that how Rolex was able to take a actually relatively small movement, like the El Primero, 
and use it in a 40 mm watch and make it feel perfectly balanced, right? And there's a couple of things that they did. One was to use a fairly thick bezel with the tachymeter engraved on it, obviously. And also they did these very chunky kind of tracks on the subdials as well, right? Uh, and the overall effect of that is even though the pinions of this movement are relatively close to the center of the watch, it feels super, super balanced. It's kind of mm -hmm. like well, the other example that may I think about when I talk about like taking a relatively small movement and making a big watch, but it's still beautiful, is the Patek 5070, right? Okay. And that watch, using the Lamani 2310, right, which pinions were relatively close because it was movement made in the 40s, but they, you know, make that 42 mm watch feel balanced by incredible design with the dial and also this really bold tachymeter, right? Yeah. So I think that that's, that's what's so cool about this watch. So you have a very particular configuration of like the subdials here. So you have um, uh, hour counter, then you have uh, your continuous seconds at, uh, at nine o'clock. Then you have your minute counter at three o'clock. So that watch, of course, was eventually replaced in 2000 by a watch that was a huge watershed moment for Rolex, and that was? 4130. Yep, it was a watch using their in-house movement, the 4130, right? And that watch was designated the 116500. Yeah. Well, 20 in the steel configuration, exactly. So what was the big deal about this watch? Well, it was actually the first time that Rolex had had their own in-house automatic chronograph movement and what a cool movement it was. Tell me a little bit about that movement. Well, so Rolex decided, you know, that they needed an in-house movement. I think it was five years in development, but I also have certain suspicions that, you know, when the, the Alang and Son uh, datograph came out in 1999, uh, which shocked the world, I think Rolex felt they, that they had to do something as well to, to, to stand up to that as well. And um, it came with a parachrome hairspring. Um, it's vertical clutch, as we said, the power reserve was extended at 72 uh, hours. Yeah, and uh, I think it's a fantastic, like you say, watershed moment for Rolex. Tell me what's so cool about a vertical clutch movement. Well, a vertical clutch movement is the way the chronograph uh, wheel is uh, designed. The chronograph wheel, which the chronograph second hand sits on, uh, it has other levers and wheels uh, attached to it as well, so it actually drops down to engage, you know, with the, the rest of the chronograph components, uh, and it doesn't draw power uh, from uh, the wheel train, uh, and it doesn't affect the amplitude as well. Yeah, so I mean, that's the cool thing about a vertical clutch movement is it, you know, you can run it all day long without it affecting the underlying timekeeping of your watch, because the reality is that a traditional chronograph, a laterally coupled chronograph, is a parasitical device. And actually, I should tell you that Jeremiah is also a watchmaker, so he knows this stuff. In another life. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually drains energy from the watch when you have it engaged. But the problem also is like, dude, how are you going to sell a Rolex Daytona to like your, some dude that walks in the store and be like, hey, bro, don't use a chronograph that often. It's kind of like, like you deciding that you want to marry a supermodel and someone telling you like, bro, don't look at her too often. <laughs> it's like, what, you know? Like, or having like, a, I think the analogy I said was like a, buying a Porsche on yeah, a turbo but, yeah. and like, please don't use the turbo that often, sir. And it's like, dude, I'm gonna use that turbo all, all the day time. long. Yeah. Exactly. At every light. Exactly, so, and I think that's fair. Like, I mean, the great thing about Rolex is, is there, you can take them right out of the box. You don't really have to read the instruction manual except for maybe the Sky Dweller. Mm -hmm. And you can just rock out with it and enjoy it, right? And the Daytona should be exactly that type of watch. So that brings me to this watch which is the 116508, which is a version of that watch uh, using the caliber 4130, which is the in-house movement vertical clutch, as Jeremiah said, and also using the parachrome hairspring. Parachrome, incidentally, is a proprietary material made by Rolex, which is consisting of two elements that sit next to each other in the periodic table. Niobium and zirconium. Yes, yeah. and niobium is really interesting because like back in the day, so now everyone's using carbon fiber wheels, but back in the day when like bicyclists were using metal wheels, they would take niobium rims and smash them into curves and watch the rims bounce back into shape because it has such an incredible um, cool. memory. Like that metal has incredible memory. So I love the fact that Rolex used uh, these two materials, made their own proprietary hair springs that probably have amazing performance ability, but also have one major advantage is they don't get magnetized. Right? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about the latest watch which I recently purchased. Well, actually, so Jeremiah asked me a very valid question. He's like, dude, well, how come you never bought yourself a 116520, which is the steel, you know, the, the same version of this yeah, watch. Yeah, the one that came after this one. But with the in-house movement, and I'm like, actually I did, but then my ex-wife, uh, which is not the reason we're divorced, like I came home from a trip once and she basically had co-opted it, right? And then like shortly after that, because I think it was a 2004, and I managed to find it because of, of all places I was in Romania. Because normally you never find these watches at retail. Right? Yes. So, 
So this brings me to this watch, which I have to say is incredible. So the major difference I'm gonna say between wearing uh, a 116500, which is the watch with the in-house movement, the you know really modern version, versus this, you know, 6241, manual wine uh, with pump pushers, or 6265, manual wine with screw down pushers, or even, honestly, even this, right? Like 16520, um, which has got the screw pushers, which is the modern design of the watch. It's a beautiful watch. It's the first Sapphire Crystal Daytona's as well. It, they all still feel like old watches. And the amazing thing about this watch is that like, you can do anything, anywhere, anytime, wearing your Daytona, and you never have to worry about it. And part of that is also down to how robust the movement is. And in the process of making the movement much more robust, they actually simplified the chronograph movement. I mean, tell me a little bit about that, German. Well, when Rolex developed the 4130, they wanted to ensure that you know it was easy to service as well, and they reduced the number of parts from the previous uh, Zenith 4030 uh, to 201 parts. That's about a 60% decrease. And if we were to compare it with some of its contemporaries, for instance, like the Omega 9300, that's 337 parts. And our friend Peter Speak Marine over at the Naked Watch Maker, he did a teardown of the Breitling B01. Which is vertical clutch also. Yes, yeah. and that one was over 350 parts, yeah. And right. something else interesting, which, which I think uh, maybe most people don't know as well, is for the Zenith uh, 4030, you had to adjust the chronograph using five screws. But with the 4130, you only just had to adjust one. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So I have to say, I've been wearing this watch now for a couple of months, and it is just amazing, right? Like, it is stunning to look at. It's, it's as if, like, the most beautiful creature on Earth, which would be my dachshund, um, her name is Bandit, was also somehow, like, the most reliable and uh, creature dedicated to taking care of me. It would be as if my dachshund would, like, I would wake up in the morning and she'd be cooking me scrambled eggs with, like, caviar, and she'd chauffeur drive me to work and you know, light my cigar perfectly for me. It's that kind of, like, incredible combination between beauty and reliability, and I think it's only Rolex that can do that. So this is going to now bring us to our speculation uh, section of the conversation, because all of us have been seeing all this incredible communication around the Daytona that Rolex has been doing on their own Instagram page, right? Yes. And usually when they're doing that leading up to Watches and Wonders, it makes you believe that potentially there might be a new Daytona. We can only hope. Right? So there have been so many rumors about a 42mm Daytona, which, okay, that's really interesting to me. Um, what would also be interesting is they've made a lot of innovation in terms of their movements, right? Like they have uh, now put the Chronergy escapement, which is their proprietary escapement, even their Siloxi hairsprings, which are their silicone hairsprings into different watches as well. But not in the Daytona. But not in a Daytona. And that's, so it would be really interesting if they were to launch something to see something from a design perspective also from a movement perspective put together which could be incredible let's talk a little bit about just the brief history of this model the 116508 right so again as I mentioned uh, it was in 2000 that you had the uh, introduction of the 116500 uh, family then uh, I guess the most important launch after that was probably in 2011 when they did that gold version with the black oh, yes, bezel, right? Yeah. I think it's 116515 yes right? 515 it was on the the, uh, the beautiful rubber strap as well yes right oyster flex well actually it's not just a rubber strap the oyster flex is cool because it's got like these metal elements inside of it and then the rubber is molded over that which is, makes it really easy to wear and the watch doesn't shift around now. Then in 2013, you had the big anniversary of the Daytona, which introduced the Platinum Daytona. Ooh, that was a sick watch. Dude. The 116506. Yes, with the ice blue dial and the brown ceramic bezel. And there's like basically two versions. That like the normal version of that's already insane, but there's two end game versions of that watch. One is the one that was made for the Middle Eastern market that's got the Hindu Arabian oh, yeah. indexes. And then another one is the one with the baguette diamond indexes, which is like <sighs> insane. Like that's, that's a dream up. watch, right? Yeah. Um, and then. After that, I guess the 2016 was when they introduced the Cerachrome, excuse me, that's a Rolex term for it, the ceramic bezels uh, in the 116500 family, right? So the 116520, uh, as of 2016 became uh, ceramic bezel watches, right? But yes. in that same year, I remember I was walking around the Rolex booth in, I think it was, yeah, it was still Basel back then. And my friend Patrick, uh, who was running Rolex in Australia, who's now become a Rolex uh, retailer there, um, Mr. Boutillier, well done, sir. Um, he was wearing this watch on his wrist. And I was like, dude, that's insane, right? That's so freaking cool. Then I was looking at it and it almost like kind of reminded me of a green dial version of a watch that came from Rolex's history and is a big part of its mythology. And you yeah. know which watch I'm talking I about. It's the 16528 chairman, the mythical reference. Yes. So tell us about that watch. 
Well, I think at the time, you know, Rolex uh, was only made 10 pieces of the 16528 and he had this incredible, beautiful uh, blue dial with blue sub-dials as well. And those 10 pieces were only uh, given to senior management in Rolex. You rarely, rarely see them. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole kind of like mythology around that watch. It's very interesting. Um, Okay, so uh, there was, I guess, two theories. One is that the, the watch, uh, actually the dials were samples and then they were distributed to the, the like senior management, um, or that they were actually made as actual watches. No one kind of really knows, such as the case of Rolex, but I do like the fact, if it is in fact a little clan d'oeil or wink, as they say in French, to um, uh, the chairman that was born in 1991, then this watch is even cooler to me. But it doesn't matter because it's just so stunning. Okay, one of the reasons I see a similarity is that that very beautiful blue sunray dial of the chairman actually changed color depending on where you were and what kind of light you had. So it could feel like almost black, mm -hmm. and then in direct sunlight it could feel like this incredible vivid blue. Absolutely same thing with this watch, like when you're in indoors, for example, if you're someone was across the table from me and it was indoors, you would think it's almost a black dial watch, but then when you go outdoors and you see how vivid and beautiful and emerald green it is. And I have to say, big shout out to Rolex also in terms of the quality of their dials. It's one of the most stunning dials I've ever had. So that concludes the story about my four Daytona collection, which I have to say, and I'm not just saying it because it's the newest, but this watch is by far the best. So much so that I'm actually thinking about selling these three watches and buying a rainbow. Because then if I have this watch and a rainbow, that's the perfect two Daytona collection, right? Could be. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Anyway, thank you guys very much. Jeremiah, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you, Wei. And uh, peace out, guys. Take care.